Dear ladies and gentlemen, I am very honored and happy to announce today's speaker, Professor Dr. Verena Krebs from the Ruhr University in Bochum, Germany. Her current research is focusing on medieval cultural realms and their entanglements, and she has investigated this field in her PhD thesis, which was published in 2018. On behalf of the German Ethiopian Association, I also want to congratulate her on receiving the prestigious Dan David Prize, which was awarded to her this year for comprehensive research in Ethiopian studies. At the moment, she is working on her next project, a monograph titled African Collecting Europe, Patronage and Power in Ethiopia, 1468 to 1530, under contract with the University of Pennsylvania Press, which is going to be released in early 2024. Today, she will present her recently published book, Medieval Ethiopian Kingship, Craft and Diplomacy with Latin Europe, which was described by Matteo Salvadore as an impressive survey of Ethiopian-European re relations, and her volume will certainly find a place in the library of most, if not all, Ethiopianists. This is very true speaking of my personal library, and I'm very and I'm looking forward to her following presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for having me. Uh, and it's interesting that you uh, quoted the Salvadora review, which out of the seven reviews currently out is the most negative one for sort of obvious reasons, as will become clear uh, in the course of this presentation, because I do take issue with his research which is fair enough, right? So it's my great pleasure to speak to you today about this book, which was first published to the day a year ago. So we're having a bit of an anniversary actually. Um, and it is the book, let me just share my screen. Uh, this is it, there we go, excellent. Can you all see it? Excellent. All right, so um, this is the book, Medieval Ethiopian Kingship, Craft and Diplomacy with Latin Europe, um, which is a book that has taken up 12 years of my MA when I came, like, when I first was looking for a topic for uh, a master's thesis, still not planning to actually go into academia because I was still planning to become a journalist uh, and came across Teresa Tamarat's book, Church and State in Ethiopia, uh, which fascinated me because one chapter mentioned the Ethiopian Solomonic embassies to Latin Europe in the 15th century, which I was just quite shocked to learn. I had never heard about even though I was a medievalist extensively working on the Middle Ages. So I first started looking at this material 12 years ago and the book only came out a year ago. So you can see it's taken up more than a decade of my life and it's been a decade of continuous research. And it's the first of two books that looks at how kingship rule legitimacy and thus power and material culture interacted in Solomonic Christian Ethiopia between the very early 15th century and the 1530s. So about roughly 130 years. And my sincere hope is that it offers a new way at looking at Ethiopian Christian history in the 15th and early 16th century. Um, the book looks closely at one specific aspect and a moment of Ethiopian Christian history namely when a good dozen embassies were sent out from Solomonic Ethiopia here in the highlands of the Horn of Africa um, to Latin Europe. And the book uses this long distance diplomacy to draw out what we can learn about local Ethiopian history, because that's the thing that concerns me and that interests me the most, not necessarily European medieval history, but local Ethiopian history of this time. Uh, so it looks at diplomacy to draw out what we can learn about local Ethiopian Christian kingship, how the Ethiopian Solomonic kings saw themselves and how they saw their place in the world. The first three chapters offer a rereading of the source material that's come down to us. And in many cases, this material has been known for decades as many sources were actually preserved by historical accident in European archives. 
Um, some sources, crucially one about the 1420s, have also come to light more recently and put a really different spin on it. Um, but the majority of the sources have actually been known for quite a long time and are preserved um, in languages, mostly of the medieval European West, so in Latin, in Italian, in Catalan, in German, in French, which is why they came to me rather easily being trained as a medievalist who grew up in Germany, where even in high school, I was forced to learn a whole plethora of different languages. Um, plus, of course, sources in Ge'ez and Arabic. So to, pour, uh, to paint a rather broad picture, over the course of about 120 years, successive Ethiopian kings sent embassies and Ethiopian ambassadors appear in very different places in the Latin Christian Mediterranean and Europe. Depending on how we count, the number of these embassies varies, but there are at least 12 missions and Solomonic ambassadors, pilgrims, and sometimes pilgrims acting as ambassadors turn up far beyond the Mediterranean in Santiago de Compostela, for example, or even on Lake Constance in modern day Germany. Now, continued and lasting contacts between distant medieval royal courts are far from surprising. Um, as art historian Finbar Flood has rightly pointed out, people and things have been mixing up for a very long time and they rarely conform to the boundaries imposed upon them by modern anthropologists and historians. And I mean, even in late antiquity, it has long been known um, that the highlands of the Horn of Africa were quite well integrated and connected to other parts of the larger Mediterranean world, especially as we know from uh, Izana's trilingual uh, or trilanguage stele in Aksum um, and the, uh, the coins minted in different languages, as well as the rather obvious influences and connections with the late antique Christian Mediterranean visible in the famous Abagarima Gospels. Um, so, however, in this specific case, more than 12 embassies over the course of just a century did cross quite a distance. So, people turned up, Ethiopian ambassadors turned up, really, as I said, in places as far removed as Valencia, Rome, and Constance and Bordensee. They needed to cross mountain ranges, deserts, and two rather large bodies of water. Even at the very best of times, a single journey was to take at least half a year. Yet, if we look at the sources, nearly all rulers and, uh, and regents of the 15th and early 16th century sent out en envoys to Latin Europe in some way. Which leads to the question at the heart of the book, namely why? Why did generations of Ethiopian Christian kings send out their emissaries? And why did they initiate contacts time and time again with different courts in Europe? Why also at this specific point in time? Why all of a sudden in the 15th century? Why is there such a flash of action? Sadly, there are no actual letters written by the Ethiopian kings that have come down to us for the first 100 years of missions. So no letters from a Solomonic ruler, for example, that's Dawid saying, I, Dawid, sent my ambassador to you, the Doge of Venice, for this and this purpose. But what we do have is the reactions on the European side. So there's a whole wealth of other texts that have been preserved. There's administrative notes, and copies of official letters, for example, an ambassador from Ethiopia came, he had four live leopards, he brought these and these gifts, and we, the Council of Venice, want to do this and this in return. There's treasury records, there's city annals, there's chronicles, there's itineraries, there's diary entries, you get the gist. And all of these, as I said, are written in the languages of the late medieval um, European Mediterranean, so Latin, Italian, French, German, Catalan, Portuguese, and even more Latin, and sometimes a mix of all of them. But of course, there's also sources from Ethiopia itself written in Ge'ez, the ancient literary and liturgical language of the Christian um, church, which dates back to the fourth century in the Ethiopian highlands. And last but not least, of course, there's also Arabic sources from Egypt, uh, Mamluk, Mamluk, Egypt, Ethiopia's northern neighbor. 
And all of these sources allow us to catch a glimpse of the Ethiopian agency, the Ethiopian Solomonic interest of what was driving these Solomonic kings to send out an ambassador on this long and arduous route time and time again. So what the first few chapters of the book then does is offer a chronological rereading and re-evaluation of the source material. I'd been trying to strip away the Latin Christian hopes and imaginings and quote unquote knowledge about Ethiopia, because God knows there's enough of these imaginings and presumed knowledge in these sources as well, because I'm profoundly uninterested in contributing more to the literature about how European Christians imagined a world in Africa they knew very little about. But if we strip it down to the bare bones, there's still a lot of knowledge we can glean. Moreover, Mamluk Egypt and Solomonic Ethiopia had their own very long and complicated history. And in the sources that have come down to us from Mamluk Egypt, we do sometimes find Egyptian Muslim fears and suspicions when it comes to the rather powerful realm in the Horn of Africa that in general, however, had comparatively good relationship, uh, a comparatively good relationship with Mamluk Egypt. So what became apparent in my research is that we when we boil it down to the smallest common denominator, there is a couple of golden threads that run through these embassies time and time again. There's a very palpable Ethiopian interest in relics, in foreign Christian religious material culture, in fine embroidered fabrics with the re religious images, in liturg liturgical objects, so everything kingly, prestigious and Christian. Yet another interest lay in the acquisition of builders, stonemasons, painters, carpenters, gold and silversmiths, and thus artisans and craftsmen skilled in trades necessary to construct architectural monuments. Like golden threads, these interests, these palpable Solomonic desires, run through each and every late medieval Ethiopian embassy, both in the 15th and even in the early 16th century. Crucially, and this is where we come to possibly where Matteo Salvadori did not quite like this book, uh, these findings are at a very stark contrast of what de uh, decades of earlier research has suggested for the better part of a century. In a major article published short shortly after the fascist Italian forces were expelled from the Ethiopian islands in the 1940s, Italian historian Renato Ferro opined that the Ethiopian kings had first approached medieval Italy out of the need for its quote unquote artistically and technological superior workforce. Even in 1402, when the first Solomonic embassy landed in Venice, the Italian uh, historian Renato Ferro said that this was caused by a lack of skilled local African labor and therefore Ethiopia had always needed Italian ingenuity and skill. It seems apparent how such ideas speak more to Lefebvre's present political moment in the mid 20th century rather than the 15th century. Yet two decades later, the same man, Renato Lefebvre, stated less bluntly that the Solomonic rulers uh, dispatched their missions out of a desire to obtain, quote unquote, masters of art and industry, industry to quote unquote, raise the tip, uh, civil and technical level of the Ethiopian kingdom. They were, according to him, driven by a need to enhance its military efficiency. It is impossible not to see the long shadow and di direct through line of colonialist thought between these two publications. The first one that I first mentioned from the 1940s and the quote that you see up on the screen here. Um, yet, in his groundbreaking work on early medieval Solomonic history, the great Ethiopian historian Tedesa Tamrad largely followed Lefebvre's interpretation because scholarship builds on one another and Lefebvre's scholarship had been the one that had most in-depth investigated the relationship between Solomonic Ethiopia and Italy in the Middle Ages. And so it's not it is not surprising that uh, Tadesse Tamrad would refer to the research that had been out there um, at this point. In an important chapter in his major work, Church and State, 
So Tedesa Tamrat also assumed that the delegation's purpose had been to ask for artists and technologists, for military experts and access to European technology. It is very hard to overstate how both scholars have impacted the field between then, so the mid 20th century, and now. Scholarship has largely and uniformly asserted that Solomonic missions to Europe were tied to a desire to, um, to uh, obtain craftsmen technologists because there was a purported need for European technology and arms and a desire for military alliances with the Christian powers of the Western Med. Yet, when I was reading the sources, that was simply not what I was finding. These ostensible Ethiopian uh, interests and desires were simply absent in all known sources for the first 100 years of contacts. And even in the, uh, in the 16th century, in a much changed politi political climate in the Horn of Africa, when guns and ideas about military alliances do appear in some letters by Ethiopian kings, such as Lipton Dingle, they also, again, reappear only alongside the requests for relics, precious religious wares, fine fabrics, liturgical items, and again, alongside a wish for, first of all, painters, craftspeople who can build objects, who can build buildings, bricklayers, stonemasons, carpenters, gold and silversmiths. In one document in 1520, Atzalip Dingle himself clearly even states that his very first request from the Portuguese, when the Portuguese finally made it to the Horn of Africa, was for roofers and for giant curtains, because he wanted to put these things uh, and to use the labor for a church that he had just built and hang the curtains in the church to make it uh, more beautiful uh, or to, to, um, to outfit it in a way that he saw desirable. And that's the key here, I think. And that's what I present in chapter five of the book and which is at the heart of the book. Namely, whoop, there we go, that the Solomonic Ethiopian interest in relics, in precious religious material culture, in liturgical objects and builders and ornamenters and painters, these red threads running through all the embassies, they fit very well into the local history of Ethiopia at that time. In the latter half of the 14th century, the consolidation of Solomonic Christian power over um, most of the central and northeast African highlands had ushered in substantial religious reforms, as well as a flourishing of religious literature. But we also find a period of monumental building activity in the central Ethiopian highland plateau. Dozens of royal prestigious churches and monasteries were being built by the same kings that were sending their embassies requesting religious wares and building related labor to Europe. These royal churches were material testament to the Solomonic king's supreme political claim to power and physical assertion of each king's rightful and just Christian rulership. And of course, such prestigious religious centers needed to be built and ornamented and endowed and furnished with precious books and in ecclesiastical fabrics and everything worthy of the kings of the Solomonic line, which propagated themselves not only as the true spiritual heirs of the biblical kings, David and Solomon, but also even as their genealogical heirs in the so-called Kibra Negast, which of course should be also familiar to most of you in the audience, um, which was the myth that legitimized uh, the rulership of the Solomonic line and narrated how the um, Ethiopian queen of Sheba bore the biblical king Solomon as son, that was then appointed king of Ethiopia, subsequently transferred the Ark of the Covenant from Jerusalem to Ethiopia, making Ethiopia the new chosen realm of God. And these rulers that came to power in the 1270s in uh, the sort of Ethiopian highlands saw themselves, as I said, as the direct genealogical as well as spiritual heirs of these biblical kings. For one part, this heirdom of biblical kingship, of Solomonic kingship, appears to have even been visible in the way these royal churches were being built. We have no surviving monuments, but we can learn a lot about these um, prestigious royal churches from written accounts um, that were written just prior to or just after their destruction. 
Again, a few common threads stand out. These churches were plated with gold and silver, encrusted with pearls, were um, following a specific way of being built, so their floor plan, and often uh, the father of a king had started the building process, couldn't continue, so his son would do it. Um, all of these would echo uh, descriptions of the building of Solomon's temple, as told in the historical books, books of the Bible. And it is inarguable that these parallels must have been apparent to contemporaries living in the Ethiopian Eritrean highlands in the 15th and early 16th century. Several Ge'ez chronicles of the time refer, for example, that this and this king behaved just as the good King Solomon, or for example, that Queen Eleni, when she herself also in the, uh, around the year 1500, built her own church, um, was outfitting it in a way that was reminiscent of the Solomon's temple, i.e. plating it in gold and silver, encrusted with pearls. Um, and of course, these places were very important, very significant to their donors um, who built them, who often also invested years, sometimes even decades, it is described, uh, to build these places, because these churches, these monuments, were often supposed to house their graves, so quintessentially important, not just to the kings, even later also their wives and mothers who also began building these churches, but for legitimizing their claim to kingship. And in the last pages of the book, therefore, I also argue that just like the way these churches appear to have been built, the embassies to Latin Europe appear to have also mirrored Solomonic state building activity. The Solomonic church building, which was state building, appears to have triggered the embassies to other foreign Christian parts of the world, the distant exotic parts of, Afran of Franklin too. Um, sending embassies to faraway places is a pattern found in most pre-modern societies, a king obtaining things from very far away, first and foremost, first shows his own vast geographical reach and power to his own people. But again, in this specific case, there's a more interesting, specifically Ethiopian Solomonic aspect here. Just as I said, the Ethiopian kings propagated themselves as the true heirs of the biblical kings David and Solomon through Solomon's Ethiopian son with the Queen of Sheba, according to the Kebrenegast, that made them the new chosen kingdom of God and the first of all Christian kings of the world. In this society and to this very foreign artist would have who is narrated as sending an embassy to a sovereign foreign king asking him to send a master artisan this was not because of lack of local skill. Instead, this foreign craftsman was supposed to work with the master craftsman in Jerusalem to try to do the impossible, build Solomon's first temple. What I show, uh, tried to show in the book then was that these parallels appear to have been readily apparent, not just to the Ethiopian kings, but also to their people. They were even apparent to foreign kings in Europe, on whom stories of Solomonic descent, as based on the Kebrenegast, had been impressed by the Ethiopian ambassadors. And that, by itself, I think, gives us a new view on how these Ethiopian Solomonic kings understood themselves and their place in the world as the first Christian kings in all the kingdoms of men, building magnificent churches instead of temples to assert their divinely sanctioned power. Uh, and lastly, what this then does is not just revise our ideas about Solomonic Ethiopian kingship in this period. I think it also sheds rather new and different light onto African Europeans and uh, after African European encounters in a time that is still often being received through a lens of European sources and defined as a European age of exploration. It also puts to rest, I think, the assumption that. Solomonic Ethiopian outreach to Latin Europe was in any way motivated by a desire for arms um, or military alliances. 
uh, because these desires just appear so much more palpable and really do run like a through line. So I think the emphasis on what must have been important to the Ethiopian Solomonic kings of this time needs to be changed. Our assumption of what was driving these outreaches and what was driving this contact um, needs to be adapted. And I hope then that through this, we get a new framework for seeing and understanding the concurrent material culture of this kingdom at this time. Because here, we find imported and even specifically commissioned religious objects from startlingly faraway places, from Crete, from Flanders, from Germany, from France, that were in royal Ethiopian hands in the late 15th and early 16th century. Historians and art historians have struggled to make sense of these objects thus far, but I think against the framework of this book, such objects become much less puzzling. They become one more aspect of a Solomonic kingdom looking both outwards and inwards in the late Middle Ages. Thank you very much. Questions? Thank you very much for this very enlightening presentation of your book.